Welcome to the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's Virtual Learning Studio in Chicago, Illinois. I am Kathleen McDonald, Senior Director of Strategy Programs and Education. Founded in 2003, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's mission is to increase the public's understanding of military history, military affairs, and national security by providing a forum for the study and exploration of our military past, present, and future with a specific focus on the stories, sacrifices, and values. With national and global reach, these spaces and events aim to share the stories of those who served, helping citizens everywhere appreciate the relationship between the armed forces and civilians whose freedom they protect. The Virtual Learning Studio offers monthly webinars designed for teachers to use in the classroom, grades six through 12 and any age beyond with guest speakers from across the country. Be sure to sign up for our emails and go to our website for information of upcoming programs. Today's guest speaker is Laura Jowdy. Since 2006, Laura has served as the Archivist and Historical Collections Director for the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. She holds a bachelor's degree in history from Harem College and a master's in library information sciences with an emphasis on archival science from the University of South Carolina. Working for the society has been the privilege of her life. She also says there's nothing quite like preserving and sharing the legacy of American's heroes. In today's presentation, Laura will take us on a journey back to the America Civil War where between 5,000 and 10,000 civilian women offered their services as nurses and hospital administrators and tell us the story of Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a battlefield surgeon, American feminist, suffragist, prisoner of war, and accused spy. Dr. Walker remains the only woman ever to receive the Medal of Honor. On behalf of the Prisker Military Museum and Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here today. Give me just a moment to share my screen. All right. So Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who was she? That's always a very good question to ask. Um, she is the only woman who has received the Medal of Honor in our military. She is also the only woman to serve as a doctor in the army, an official medical doctor in the army during the Civil War. So when I say the Medal of Honor, what is it? The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat that American troops can receive. Um, there's three different designs, one for the major branches, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. The Marine Corps gets the Navy, as does the Coast Guard if they are eligible and currently serving under the Department of Defense at the time. So it's, it's a very high award. Um, now, one of the things that I always like to talk about when we start talking about her is the use of some historical sources. Um, here on this um, slide, you see some early dates related to her life and things we know are, are true based on evidentiary uh, things like the census or her record with the army and the adjutant general and her commanders and things. But one of the things you have to consider with her because she was somebody who was outspoken and outside of the norm is who wrote this? Um, what's the source of it? Who were they writing it for? What was their purpose? And so with Mary, a lot of times you get kind of conflicting views of her. And this is really important. So as we go through, we'll look a little bit more into those. Um, also, we need to keep in mind that in the 19th century, when Mary primarily lived, there were slightly different definitions to some words than what we use now. Um, terms like, a ra like radical or free thinking or even the use of the word queer. Um, this was used to describe Mary a lot. Today, it has different connotations than it did in the 19th century where it just meant strange or different than the mainstream. So I kind of wanted to throw those out there and we'll kind of touch on those things as we go through as well, because I think it's an important thing to consider when looking at historical sources and when you're talking about a historical individual. Moving on, Mary was born in 1832 um, to Alva and Vesta Walker. She was the fifth of six children. Here on this screen, this is the family homestead. This is where she was born and grew up. Uh, Alva and Vesta were interesting individuals for even the time period. Now, mind you, they're up in New York. She was born in Oswego, New York. And kind of in that region of New York and New England at the time, there were a lot of um, social and religious um, movements going on. Um, in particular, there was a 
a huge abolitionist movement going on there. And of course, abolition um, means against slavery because at the time the South was still deep in racial slavery. Um, there was the suffragette movement, the right for women to vote was a movement that was going on. There were a lot of independent religious movements going on and Alva and Vesta were no different. Um, they were known as what were called free thinkers which at the time meant people who questioned how things were done and why they were done that way. So for instance, they had five daughters. They were all extremely well educated for the times. Um, Alva and Vesta, they didn't have that division in, in labor that you would expect a household to have at the time. The dad did some sewing. The mom was out on the farm with the heavy equipment. Um, they also had their own interpretation of religion. They definitely believed in the equality of the sexes. They didn't attend a regular church um, like you would expect them to at this time. They also um, believed that women had a right to dress as they wished. So when she was a teenager and Mary decided, you know, I don't want to wear these heavy gowns, these heavy dresses, and she started wearing short trousers and with a shorter dress. They actually supported her in that decision. They didn't wear corsets in the household, that sort of thing. So there were some different sort of views they were practicing in the household. And this is all very important as time goes by for Mary, because this is the environment she grew up in. So her father at the time had an interest in medicine. And in some, this is where we get to what the historical sources say. Some historical sources say her father was actually a country doctor, self-taught. Um, there's really not much evidence of that, but he was certainly interested in medicine. And maybe he talked with the neighbors and said, you know, you should try this for that condition or this for that condition. So maybe not a doctor in the terms that we would consider a doctor today, but maybe the person you went to for basic advice on basic illness, that kind of thing. But the point was he had this library of medical books. Well, Mary was fascinated by these books and she wanted to find a way to make an impact in the world that was slightly different than what was expected probably of women at the time. So for her, this idea of medicine really caught hold and became the way that she decided she was going to make an impact on the world in a different way than what was expected of women. So she taught school for a few years after when she was a teenager, early teens. But in, 19, in 1853, she decided she was going to go to medical school. And this is important because in 1849, just six years earlier, the first woman had finally graduated with an actual medical degree from an accredited medical university. Her name was Elizabeth Bachwell, and she graduated from Geneva Medical College in New York. So Mary went to Syracuse Medical College in New York. Uh, it was one of the first schools that actually welcomed women into its programs. And this was what was called an eclectic school of medicine. And you got to remember that, again, just like there were all these different social movements going on at the time, one of them was this idea, there were a lot of different ideas and thoughts on medicine and how it worked. We're not too far away from that period where bloodletting was sort of the solution to everything. Um, so the eclectic school of medicine, their primary way of doing medicine was to look at what worked for the patient. They wanted evidence-based solutions for things. Now, this idea, of course, finally gets folded into modern medicine that we use today in the Western world, right? I mean, we test drugs before we start giving them to the public. That's what the FDA is doing. We don't just randomly read something and start doing it. We do some evidence and we want to make sure it works for most people before we start implementing it long term and in a larger population. So in a way, this school of medicine is a little bit ahead of its time as well. So Mary's not only dressing, quote unquote, like a man. Um, but she's also attending this school. So she graduates in 1855 with 12 people in her, in her class. Um, at the time, she um, meets another fellow student named Albert Miller, and they actually end up getting married. And just like everything else in her life, her medal, in her marriage vows, she refuses to use the word obey. She refuses to obey Albert Miller. And this was actually supported by both her family and the Reverend marrying her. Um, his name was um, Reverend Samuel May, and he was a radical Unitarian um, abolitionist pre preacher in the area. So it was, she's, I mean, you could see the people she's associating with and talking with. And, you know, so she goes into this marriage with Albert and it ends up not going well. <laughs> um, she kicks him out four years later uh, because he was cheating on her and she starts looking for a divorce. It took 10 years for that divorce to come through because she's a female and there were a lot of rules against that in New York state, but it finally does come through. And this is important also now for Mary because she's had a marriage that didn't go well. And so she's also looking for quality of the sexes. So this impact of not being able to get a divorce when she wants one is something else that drives her going forward and women's rights later on in her life. 
So civil war starts and Mary is above all a patriot. So in 1861, she heads down to D.C. and she starts petitioning. She wants to be an official medical officer. She has a medical degree. She's had a private practice for a while. Maybe didn't go so well in the private practice, but she's decided that she has the credentials and she can really help. This is what she's going to do to help the country. So she starts petitioning to actually become an official medical doctor with the Army. Um, This is rebuffed. Um, There's no precedent for it. and The Army's a little bit worried about trying to, you know, start this. So they start, they form a board to, you know, test her and see how her knowledge is. And the board comes back and says, she doesn't know anything. She wouldn't help us. She's maybe okay with gynecological conditions, but we really don't think she'd be a good person for the army. And the question is, again, we have to look at the source. Um, These are medical doctors that are probably set in their ways. And Mary's coming in with her eclectic school of medicine thought. Um, And she may have been a great doctor, but this board certainly didn't think so. And they certainly maybe had a reason not to um, recommend her for this position. But in any case, her efforts get turned down. And so in 1862, a year later, she heads back up to New York um, to get some more schooling. She later returns um, down to um, D.C., the Virginia area. And she starts serving at a place called the Indiana Hospital, which was one of the ad hoc hospitals set up in D.C. And it's in the incompleted U.S. Patent Office building. So there's, you know, these grand marble floors and pillars. And she writes home about this experience and how great this hospital is, that it's clean. I'm, I'm sure it was easy to keep clean with all the hard surfaces. <laughs> and just, you know, the doctor in charge, his name uh, was Dr. James Green. And he's so impressed with her, he starts recommending her to get an official uh, appointment as well and get paid because right now it's all volunteer. She's volunteering her time to help these guys. And mind you, this is a hospital that's a little bit away from the front lines. Mary wants to be where the action is. So Mary starts going over to the front lines in Virginia area and helping with the guys on the front line. And then she ferries back the ones who are so severely ill or injured that they need further time to recuperate or before they can be released from service. So she's going to the front lines and ferrying people back from the tent hospitals to the more solid back lines hospitals where they can get more intense treatment. Uh, she also at this time sets up the Home for Homeless Women and women and the Women's Release Associ- Relief Association. And the idea is the Relief Association helps war widows and families where maybe the breadwinner has been so injured he's having trouble finding a job. So it's a financial type of help for people who need it. The home for homeless women is the idea is it'd be women who find themselves pregnant outside of marriage. And at the time, this was, of course, very, 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 you know, wrong, according to society. So these women oftentimes had trouble finding jobs. At the time, childbirth was even harder than it is today. And so they wouldn't be able to work after having the child either. So there was a foundling hospital or a place for the babies to go and a place for mom to rest while she had the baby. And then the idea was the women would also get better uh, job treatment and job training while they were there too. So afterwards they could go out and get better paying jobs. That was kind of a short lived exercise. There were a lot of backlash against this idea of this hospital for these women who were pregnant outside of marriage. But in any case, this is kind of where Mary's mind is going. She's looking for ways to help people and meet a need she sees as needing to be met. Oops, sorry about that. We're going backwards for a moment. We don't wanna do that. Okay, so in 1863, with Dr. James Green's help, she finally gets her appointment as an acting assistant surgeon in the Army. So finally, she's getting paid. She's getting about $100 a month. Um, She puts together this uniform that you see her wearing here with her long hair. Um, You see the stripe down the leg. This is uh, something she put together herself. So it kind of looks like the medical, what other medical doctors were wearing, but yet it's still that slightly feminine look. Um, She wanted people to know she was a woman. She wrote later on that she let her hair grow out on purpose. She wanted people, even though she's dressed, quote unquote, like a man, she wanted (laughs) people to know that she was a woman. And she was proud of this, that she was a female serving in the army and doing what she could to help the country. Now, just because she achieved this um, officer position doesn't mean she was well received by her, uh, by the other doctors in the army. Me. Um, some of them objected to her, what they saw as a lack of knowledge. Some of them objected to the fact that she went around and actually talked with some of the patients and said, look, you don't need an amputation. 
you know, this, this can heal, I can heal this. So, uh, you know, when you've got so many wounded, it was easier for other doctors to maybe go, we don't have time to wait on this guy. We need to just, you know, cut off the arm and move on. And Mary's whole point was, but we don't need to. So sometimes she's advising patients to go against the other doctor's recommendations. So there was a lot of push and pull in there with Mary. Plus she was also rather outspoken and brash individual. So I'm sure she rubbed people the wrong way, just that way. Now in 1864 in April, she is captured. Um, one of the things she would do is she would go out to the picket lines and sometimes past the picket lines where she was helping even people on the Confederate side, on the Southern side who were injured or ill. She would go to civilian homes if she felt if there was a need for a doctor there. So she's treating people sort of on both sides of the, of the lines and she's at the picket line when she's captured. Uh, one of the things she supposedly said is, I just wanted to deliver some letters. Uh, so uh, another report said, she was caught because she was lost and wandered her way into the Confederate lines and they took her prisoner. There, this is another time when you have to look at the evidence. Um, some of the Confederate reports write that she was a spy, but it, there's no proof of that. But on the other hand, Mary was such a patriot that, that personal opinion, I think that if she saw something, she would probably report it back to her superiors when she got back to the Union lines. It wouldn't have surprised me. Whether they believed her is another matter just because of who she was. She was, again, very outspoken and rubbed people the wrong way. But we do know that some of the journals she served under actually appreciated her and liked her. So it's very possible she was a spy and getting information back all these times she went over to talk with and help those on the other side of the lines. So when she's captured, she slowly gets taken back east and she ends up here at Castle Thunder in Richmond. Now, this is just down the road from Libby Prison. So there's been some arguments that maybe the Confederates saw her more of a political prisoner than a actual, you know, combatant arms prisoner of war um, prisoner. It might have been just that she was female and they didn't want to throw her in with the men. We don't know. There's this there's a southern notion of some southern culture kind of, I think, folding into this decision. But in any case, they put her here at Castle Thunder and in July of 1864, she writes home to her mother, I hope you are not grieving about me because I'm a prisoner of war. I am living in a three-story brick castle with plenty to eat and a clean bed to sleep in. I have a roommate, a young lady about 20 years of age. I am plenty happy here. The officers are gentlemanly and kind, and it will not be long before I am in exchanged. Now, this is interesting because if you read letters that other soldiers in other wars have written home, to their families, you kind of get the same tone. I'm a prisoner of war, but it's okay. I'm eating, it's fine, I'm being taken care of. And then afterwards, you get this report by Mary, which also follows the same pattern of other we see with other people who are prisoners of war, where Mary wrote, the peas were always wormy. The rice was sometimes good, but generally was musty or contained vermin. The bacon in several instances was so rotten that its odor was unendurable to me after it was served and it would be just holding together. So you kind of get these two dual sided things. I mean, one letter, one thing's hap while she's in the prison, right? She's writing home to her family saying, again, everything's fine. And then afterwards she's recounting the true thing. And I think that's a reassurance thing that people do with their loved ones when they're in a bad situation. So in August of 1864, four months later after being captured, she is finally exchanged. And she's exchanged with, um, for a Tennessee officer surgeon. And she's very proud of this because she's being exchanged for a full officer in the enemy army. And for her, that really just solidifies her position with the US Army. And so she gets exchanged, she goes back to DC and a month later, she's already trying to get back to the front and to be back with her soldiers and be treating them. Instead, they sent her to Kentucky to work at a, a sort of relief hospital for widows and children. And she does okay there, but eventually, you know, I mean, that's not what she wants to do. She wants to serve the country and work with the actual soldiers. And it never really happens again. And some of it is her health. Um, from eating the wormy peas and the vermin-filled rice, she's not in the best of health. So 10 months after that, um, she actually requests to be released from her commission. And that decision was not only her health, but also because she kept trying to get an official, official commission from President Lincoln. President Lincoln was 
I, he wasn't too certain that should be a good idea. So he deferred to his commanders and his commander said, there's no precedent to actually make her a full on officer. She wanted to be a major. And so they kept, they again told her no. So her solution to that was to quit and the war was over and also by the time she requested her release. So in November of 1865, almost if you will, as a, I'm trying to think of the right, word, I'm sorry, almost as a concession to her, um, they give her the Medal of Honor. And in, the, in this, they recognize number one, her valor um, in going to the front lines when maybe others wouldn't, for treating those on the other side of the lines, um, her willingness to endure um, privations and difficulties. Um, so, I mean, it, she definitely deserved it based on that. And so they awarded her medal in 65. In 1916, 1970, 17, the Army does a review of all medals of honor presented up to that point in the Army. And that includes a review of Mary Walker's medal. And the review board decides to take away Mary's medal, basically. It's rescinded, along with 911 others. And the basis for rescinding Mary's is that she was an acting um, assistant surgeon, not a surgeon. So technically she was a civilian and not a member of the military. So her medal was rescinded based on a technicality. In 1977, there was another review done by the army where they decided that the 1970 decision was in error. And so Mary's medal was restored. So today she is again, the only female medal of honor recipient. And I wanted to share this with all of you. This is the original decree citation for her medal. And I thought it was important to share that. And I think now we're going to pause and maybe do some questions. I do have some questions um, to ask. And um, first of all, why was she the only Civil War recipient uh, for an aggregate of services rather than an act? That's a good question. Um, there were a couple of others that come to mind, but they were actually for multiple battles. There's a couple where a gentleman received his medal for Gettysburg. His citation also includes two other battles. And of course, I can't remember his name at the moment. And there were a couple of others where it was, you know, for actions at Fort Fisher and Fort something else. And of course, it's escaping my memory right now. So but hers was for a period of time. Yes. And I think part of it is because they were trying to recognize all of her service and encompass it all as opposed to say, one particular instance. Um, and I think that's because there were probably so many of them, quite frankly, and some of that's a personal opinion, but I do believe that they were trying to encompass everything she had done instead of looking at one particular instance. But that's a good question. Great. Um, you also mentioned that she was um, at the the castle uh, when she was a POW with another young lady. And uh, was that also a POW? Um, yes. And unfortunately, I don't remember the girl's name, but she was suspected of being a spy. And they did have a few other females um, incarcerated there, held there. Um, for various things, probably for some sedition, um, for being a spy, for that sort of thing. And they also kept some officers, male officers, um, there as opposed to over in Libby Prison. Hmm. Okay. Um, we have another question. Did she speak any other languages? That's a very good question. And I'm pretty sure she studied some Latin. Um, with her medical training and also in some of her writing she uses some latin terminology and it wouldn't surprise me because one of the things that mary was really big into is lifelong learning she mm -hmm. was always studying and reading and informing her opinions based on what she studied so it wouldn't surprise me if she did we know later in her life she did some speaking tours in europe mm -hmm. um, so i'm sure she picked up some there as well but i can't really say for certain um, going back to her upbringing, um, you mentioned that she had some siblings and her whole family were th free thinkers. Yeah. Um, did her siblings follow a similar uh, public path 
um, and all of these, um, you know, very radical ideas and actions? Not particularly, no. Um, she was particularly close with her brother, and he served in the Civil War as well. And we know at one point Mary went down to try to find him when he was still in the South and she had already been released as part of a, as being a POW. Um, he never, again, historical sources, and we aren't sure exactly how kind they were being or mean, uh, but her brother was also seen as an odd duck up in the South area. And so I think he was outspoken, but maybe less so on a national scale the way Mary was. And Mary certainly had immediately after the Civil War anyway, the platform to have her views be heard. Um, and, and in the 19th century, speaking tours were the concert of, you know, the, <laughs> of, the, of um, society. So she went on speaking tours after the Civil War and made a fair amount of money and was had that platform to share her views with hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. So you talk about her having this um, this sort of elevated national position and platform after the Civil War, but you mentioned earlier um, that she had appealed directly to President Lincoln about getting um, her own full commission. Um, that's a pretty unusual thing to you know kind of overt the general chain of command and go right to the commander in chief. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about how she got to that level of, of outreach? Mary was her own force of nature. So if she wasn't getting the response that she felt she deserved from the person right on, you know, she command, she who was right above her in command, she would jump ahead. Um, later in life, um, she would actually just show up and talk to congressmen or the department, she'd show up to the Secretary of Defense's office and demand a meeting. And so I'm sure she felt there was no hubris in writing directly to President. So she did a lot of this, you know, you say just showing up physically in mm -hmm. Congress and um, letter writing campaigns and all of that. Um, so right. And really for her, that was, it, it was, it was just, um, We'll talk about this just a bit later too. For her, patriotism wasn't this inactive thing. Patriotism had to be active. So in her mind, you show up, right? You do. Mm -hmm. um, so she wouldn't, I mean, she obviously approved if you put the flag in front of your house, but then she probably would have said, okay, what else are you going to do? <laughs> you know, it's lovely. You have the flag hanging there. What else are you going to do to make the country better? You know, so and her mind doing was the thing. So she was able to go and intervene or talk to the directly to the department, the Secretary of Defense and say, you know, I've got female nurses who served during the Civil War and they need a pension. I mean, she was going to do that. Um, and then when she said that she was an abolitionist, um, can you tell us more about what she did with that before she... Um, before the war started? Well, before the war started, she didn't really have the platform she had after the war because during the war, she was such a, if you will, spectacle in Washington, D.C. that she was reported on in a lot of papers, both in the Confederate side and the Union side. So she became sort of this mini celebrity by word of mouth during the Civil War, which mm -hmm. led to her popularity after the Civil War. So I, I know she attended some of the lectures of the abolitionists up in the New England area. We know that she was writing opinion letters, um, but it wasn't certainly at you know, the level that she was able to do after, you know, after the war where she was able to really speak out and condemn it. By that time, slavery was over, but it, part, for her, part of supporting the Union cause was getting rid of slavery as well. Well, let's let you get back to that story. Okay. So these are sort of Mary Walker's causes um, going forward with the rest of her life. And it's really just a continuation of what started before the war and during the war. Patriotism, um, dress reform, and women's rights and suffrage. So again, patriotism um, for Mary is, is actually tied into women's rights. We'll get into that in a little bit later. later. But she, again, she felt patriotism was something you had to do. You had to show it. You had to act on it. It wasn't something you just sat back and did nothing with. So I'll let you guys. 
I love this quote from her. Um, she was actually talking to the Union League of DC during the war. <laughs> And she's telling them, you know, some of you who have no patriotism but to come to gatherings and applaud good speeches, you know nothing about patriotism that is willing to die for one's country. So she was definitely strongly opinionated and wasn't afraid to tell people what she thought. On women's rights for her, um, women's rights were God-given. So any of man's laws that negated that um, were in error and needed to be corrected. So equality is innate. So there, it's a natural law and there are natural rights. And she wrote freely about that and spoke about it, particularly when she was doing the speaking tours after the Civil War and onward. Because this is a time when women couldn't vote. Uh, in most states, women were considered property of their husbands. In some states, they couldn't own property themselves. Um, if they got married, the property was their husbands, it wasn't theirs anymore. In some states, there were limits on what women could inherit if their husband died. Um, but divorce law was almost impossible in a lot of states. And Mary, of course, was living that. <laughs> she, her divorce wasn't finalized until 1869. So for a great period here, she's living with that. And she testified to Congress a lot about women's rights and the need for women to have the right to vote and be on the ballot and run for positions and support their country the way they should. Um, she saw no reason why women couldn't, you know, have political rights to act on their own patriotism. In 1873, she wrote what she called her crowning constitutional argument. And this is an idea that sort of slowly gathered steam. And it's a bit technical, uh, but if you'll bear with me here, <laughs> the suffragettes at the time were pushing to have a constitutional amendment passed, giving women the right to vote. Um, and they did so kind of within what was considered the woman's sphere. Um, they spoke gently. They, they were still forceful women and a force to be reckoned with, don't get me wrong. But it, their whole idea in some cases was to convince the husbands to allow it to happen. Um, and then of course, a secondary thing was to you know, convince women because there were some women who were against women having the right to vote that women should vote. Mary came out and said, no, no, we already have the right to vote. The constitution doesn't start with we, the men, it starts with we the people. And God has already made us equal, therefore women should have the right to vote. So that was her crowning constitutional amendment. Now this put her at odds with the mainstream suffragettes and the mainstream um, push to get women the right to vote. And they did not get along very well. And some of it, I think, was also that Mary this whole time is slowly evolving what she's wearing. Um, by the time she passes away, she's actually wearing full-on men's male attire suits. Uh, so, in a way, Mary is almost what the caricatures of the mainline suffragettes like um, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony, they're being characterized and, you know, made fun of in papers for being mannish. And Mary's out there actually presenting in these clothes that were considered traditionally masculine. So, in some ways, there's this push against Mary and this radical notion that you don't need a constitutional amendment, that women are equal anyway, and, and just her manner was a bit, I think, different than what they wanted to deal with. Now here we see Mary again. Um, this is one of her comforting things. Uh, one, of, one of the ways she dressed, um, you see the trousers and the kind of shortened dress. Um, in 1850, there was this idea that came up. There was Paris fashion, which is your traditional fashion with the corset and the big dresses at the time. And in 1850, a lady named Amelia Bloomer, who had a fairly well-spread um, magazine subscription that she wrote herself and edited herself, which is radical to begin with, but she introduced this concept, this dress that had actually been around a while. And her name ended up being led to this method of dressing, which was called Bloomers. Uh, and it was a big kind of puffy pant with a shortened skirt over it. And they, um, it was something that actually took the country by storm for a bit. Mind you, most women still weren't wearing it, but it was seen enough that it became popularized and became known as a bloomer dress. So Mary is kind of wearing something like that here. Um, it was sort of her, her way of marrying the two. And Mary's whole idea with dressing was that it was unhealthy to dress the way women were dressing in the traditional quote unquote Paris fashion. Um, with the all the skirts and all that. Now she saw it as unhygienic. So in her writing, she refers to it as unhygienic. Now, unhygienic at the time didn't mean what it means now, meaning dirty or um, 
not clean or infested with disease and such. Unhygienic just meant it was unhealthy. And so Mary developed these kind of reform dress guidelines that there shall be perfect freedom of movement. And she felt that the corset and the tight arms of the dresses didn't allow freedom of movement. Um, there would be an equal distribution of fabric for reasons of warmth and comfort. So instead of having five layers, you know, below the waist with all the dresses and skirts and under things, um, and then just the one layer or two layers on the top, that was, you know, didn't distribute your, your heat comfortably. And her third point was that the arrangement should be such that as little effort should be expended in carrying it about. So if you think of the hoop skirts in particular that were popular before the Civil War in the South, um, the fact that some of them couldn't fit through doorways would have horrified her, and I'm sure it did. Uh, she also saw traditional fashions as a waste of money and time. She didn't understand or didn't think it was worth changing your clothes all the time, as they did with fashion. And she didn't believe that spending all that money on fancy fabrics was necessary when you could simply throw on a pair of trousers and a sort of overcoat skirt like she has on here. Um, now, one of the things we hear about Mary a lot, and I think it's something that a reporter got a hold of and just it got repeated through history, is that she was arrested for wearing pants. She wasn't ever really arrested for wearing pants. What she was arrested for was making a public spectacle and being a public nuisance <laughs> because she would walk down the streets and crowds would form around her and apparently they would just follow her like she was some kind of circus sideshow. And she would show up at place and try to go in a door and someone would stop her and say, what are you doing? And she, she'd say, I'm still coming in. They're like, you can't come in dressed like that. So we know, for instance, she was taken to booking in a couple of cities in um, Cleveland, in Washington, D.C., in New York City. For the most part, all the charges were dropped by the time they got her back to the jail uh, because they looked at her and go, well, what was she arrested for? The charging officer would say, well, you know, she was blocking traffic. She, you know, she was causing people to stop and stare. And the higher officer would go, that's, you know, <laughs> how do we prove that? So well, ha half the time she was really released. Uh, she wasn't ever really arrested for wearing pants. It was just, you know, and she put, another thing we hear is that she, Congress actually voted for her to have the right to wear pants. And that's sort of a myth, I think, that's been propagated again. It's just been repeated time and time again. And I think Mary would have not been happy about that. I mean, she saw her right to wear pants and dress as she chose as her right. Um, she frequently would say, I don't wear men's clothes, I wear my clothes. And so for her, it, you know, I think to have Congress say, yes, you can wear these clothes would be something that would be offensive to her because she was just doing what she wanted to do and didn't think Congress needed to give her that. Just another quick couple notes about her. In 1881 and 1890, she actually tried to run for Congress, once for the Senate and once for the House of Representatives. She was not allowed to be on the ballot because again, female. Um, in 1901, she circulated a petition for clemency for the man who assassinated President William McKinley. Um, this caused the Pension Bureau, because she was getting a pension, uh, was looking at maybe pulling her, pulling her pension because um, they saw this as un-American, but there was nothing on the books that allowed them to do that. But it's another instance of Mary, you know, standing up for what she thought was right and being very vocal about it and upfront. She was an opponent of tobacco and alcohol use, and in 1895 to 1897, there was an idea circulating that maybe she was going to start what she called an atomless Eden, and it'd be a place for women to go and learn new job skills and new trades, and it would be a place, obviously, women only. Um, that's the atomless part. <laughs> and then go back out into the world and earn a living. Um, so that certainly would have been interesting. She had like 130 acres in New York she was going to set this thing up with, but there's no evidence it really ever came to fruition. So here we have two quotes about her and I love them both. Um, in particular, one from her that I have done it and I am not sorry for it. Um, and that's very true in Mary Walker style. <laughs> so. She did quite a few things in her life and she was not sorry for any of it. And even though it made her life probably harder than it needed to be, she was going to, she had the integrity to stay true to what she believed was right. And if nothing else, that makes her a woman worth knowing.
And then here, these are some of the last pictures taken of her. Um, you see her here on the left between the two other ladies. And you can really compare how other women were dressing at the time compared to her. She's in what's full typical male attire. And on the right, you see sort of the full body of her there walking down the street. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I've got my phone number here and my email. So if anybody wants to have other questions that maybe we don't get to now um, or something occurs to you, you can reach out and let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. So we certainly do have some time for questions. So feel free to enter something in. Um, we do have one here uh, that asks about, um, you, you brought up that the Medal of Honor, they tried to rescind that. And she was part of a much larger group that they were doing that with, from what I understand. Can you talk more about that whole process? Because I know it's a pretty complex uh, piece of, here you go, we're taking it away. Now we'll, you know, we'll let you still keep it, um, all of that. So if you could do all of that and bring us up to um, maybe that 1977 um, milestone. Absolutely. Um, and I, throughout the years prior to night from 1961 to 19 or 18, 1961 to 1916, there had been a whole lot of questions about Medal of Honor policy and who should get it and what the standard should be. And at what point did something become above and beyond? And there was a lot of effort to also look at, um, in the 1890s, a lot of Civil War guys started saying, hey, you know, I should get the medal or my buddy should have the medal. And they started applying in droves, really. So they also started instituting things like you need eyewitness statements and you need um, after action reports and they started putting in time limits so that you know you could only go back a few years to get the medal. And so by 1916 there was a lot of questions as to whether everybody who had received the medal should have received the medal. So they appoint Congress appointed a board of generals to sit down and look at all of the, the Army Medal of Honor awards. And what they did is they stripped the names off of them, they stripped the ranks off of them, um, they left just that citation nugget and they applied numbers to them. And then they looked at the citations and they looked at the evidence for the award of the medal, case by case by case. And it was like 1500 cases, I think it was, they looked at. And at the end, um, they stripped Mary Walker and six other individuals who were technically civilians. And the one, the other ones they stripped were um, people like William Bill Cody and William Dixon, and they were Indian scouts. So they were technically contracted with the army. And so they stripped those. And then they also stripped the individuals who had received it for being part of Lincoln's funeral guard. Um, they decided that wasn't really a valor situation. And they also stripped a whole bunch of guys. The biggest group uh, was the guys who, they were called the 27th Maine Regiment, who stayed in Washington, D.C. to defend Washington, D.C. at a time when D.C. was looking like it was going to be attacked and was attacked. And they gave it, they gave the medal to everybody in the regiment, even though some of them had gone home because their stint in the army was over and they didn't want to stay. And then there were some who stayed, but they gave it to the entire regiment because nobody kept good records about who went home and who stayed. And in the end, this review board in 1916 just decided, yeah, this isn't, this isn't a state a situation involving particular value, valor either. So in the end, it was 911 names were stricken from the record. Now, Mary and the other people who were stripped for being civilians were, there was a bit of an outcry about it, you know, but, you know, because particularly if you look at, say, the Indian scouts, they're in a situation right alongside um, the individuals actually in the army fighting. Um, they're actually there in the battle. So those were seen as really controversial. Mary's wasn't as well because the people who liked her were upset about it. Um, the people who appreciated her service and her, and her valor to treat those who were on the other side of the line encouraged to do that. And so really almost from the point they were stripped, there was a lot of outcry about it. And Mary never took hers off. She wore it every day. Um, she, it was stripped in 1917 and she died in 1919. So for those two years, she still wore it. She wore it to go talk to Congress. She wore it to go talk to congressmen and Department of Defense. And so she's still wearing it. She says, this is my medal. You awarded me this. So she completely ignored the recension order. And 
again, that's such merry fashion to do that. <laughs> Now, in 1977, there was finally enough of a movement and an impetus to get it reinstated to her on the basis that it was really technicality, that it was taken away, that she was still there and up front with the, with the troops. And at that point, there had been a few other s- sort of similar medals awarded for, but those weren't over time, but in any case. Um, so in 1977, hers is, and the other civilians then are also reinstated in 1989. It just took a bit longer to get those through the pipeline. So I don't, I hope that answers the question. It was really, the, the review board was instituted to tighten up the regulation. Right. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but no one was actually um, asked to return the medals. They were just told that that was no longer, they were being... Um, on paper taken away. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Can you tell us how did she get a pension if she was never officially an army surgeon? Um, She went along the same lines that the army nurses got pensions and a lot of the Mm -hmm. medical people got pensions. Um, And I'm, hers was based on the fact that she you know, I think it has to go with, she was determined to be technically a civilian in 1916. So during all those years, it would have been, you know, I'm actually, you know, acting assistant surgeon and I served with the army and therefore I should have a pension. And I think it was looked at that way. So when the decision was made that she was actually a civilian and that was, if you will point it out by the review board, it was later on in her life. So, you know, if you go along with the idea that she wasn't technically a civilian all those other years, you can see how she got a pension. And going back to the um, the medals, you had mentioned that some of the Native American scouts were stripped of their medals um, mm-hmm. as being contractors. Were those medals ever restored? Do you know? They were in, in 1989. 1989. So posthumously. Mm-hmm. Um, So you mentioned when you were talking about her being a suffragist um, that she had looked at the we the people as being the argument to include women. Hadn't many other groups tried using that argument and not being very successful before? I'm certain they had. (laughs) I'm wondering why she kept that same tack and wasn't more open to the amendment idea. You know, it's hard to say. I think she was just so certain in her thinking that women were equal to men. And that was, she never saw any, I mean, she continually went and tried to vote. She would go to the polls to vote and they would say, no, you're not putting it out of, because she was showing it up as being her God-given right to participate in society fully. And I think that was a big part of it too. I think her using that crowning constitutional amendment, as she called it, was simply a way of reinforcing her own views of that. And honestly, I think she just wanted to look at it a different way than the mainline people. I mean, she felt you already had this right, ladies, just step up and take it. She certainly tried. She certainly did. She certainly did. Can you tell us more about with the history of the Congressional Medal of Honor? Um, You talked about valor um, being defined above and beyond, but this all needs to take place in uh, active battlefield situations, correct? And can you outline the um, progress of women being allowed onto the battlefield and being allowed into combat situations? Right. And little bit of a personal opinion will come out in this. Um, there, for a long time, the perp- it was women can't serve in combat situations, right? We know in 2013, um, the Defense Department and the Pentagon made the announcement that that was going to go away and that and by 2015, it was actually implemented. Mm-hmm. It's been a while to write policy, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, but it, you see, like, even with Mary Walker and the nurses during the Civil War, um, going back further, the Crimea, you go back into what we would call ancient history with Boudicca and in, you know, the 1400s with Queen Isabella, these are women who are in combat, you know, so 
you can't tell me they weren't because <laughs> they're there with bombs exploding and we have wounds that they incurred in battles. They're documented. And so, you know, why would you be shot if you weren't in combat? <laughs> You know, so then as you move forward in time again and you're back into, say, World War One, you've got nurses on the front lines. World War Two, you've got the waves and the wax and the women's Marine Reserve Corps. I might have messed up the word mm-hmm. those words. But, you know, these are women whose jobs are to essentially be on the front line and provide support, you know, for the men who are on <laughs> who are actually in combat. Um, when you get through to particularly the wars that we just had in Iraq and Afghanistan, you've got women in logistics battalions and they're being captured in POWs. Um, they're being shot at. And so in my mind, this is really, it, it, it almost just a, the 2015 um, change is really just an acquiescence to reality. And some of it might be the way warfare has changed as well. Um, we certainly didn't have the front lines we had in World War II and World War One, for example. Um, war changed quite a bit by the time we got to Afghanistan and Iraq. You've got a lot more of the guerrilla warfare that started developing and really be prevalent, for instance, in the Vietnam War. Um, one of the Medal of Honor recipients, um, Drew Dix from the Vietnam War, he actually received his medal for, in part, going into an area that had been overrun by the enemy to rescue um, some medical personnel, including a nurse, a female nurse. So to say women weren't allowed in combat um, doesn't make logical sense to me. Um, And so then you get to the follow-on question of why is Mary Walker the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor? (laughs) That's kind of the next logical question. And I don't really have an answer for that, except that, you know, official policy said that women couldn't be in combat is really the only way I, I can answer that question. And it seems like they've been doing a lot of reviews lately based on racism and bias in awarding the Medal of Honor. And it's entirely possible that they could end up doing a review for women to get the medal. And that's really all I'm gonna say about that because the Medal of Honor Society is not involved in awarding the medal. We don't look at, we don't look at the claims that's all done with the military. Um, they have a whole system in place and policies. So do you know they, of other women the ones that, that do all the things. Do you know of other women that have been nominated for the award? No, I don't. Um, And that's because the whole process is kept um, under wraps and quiet. Um, And even the society doesn't, I mean, we hear rumors that so-and-so or there's going to be a medal, you know, from Syria or from Iraq or something, you know, for these years. And, but we don't consider it completely gold standard solid until it's announced by the commander in chief, the president. Mm-hmm. So we sometimes hear rumors, but I mean, we're not part of the presentation process, so I can't speak to women being nominated or anyone being nominated, really. Right. Right. Um, were there other activities that she did after the war um, supporting women's rights? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Um, she had that big national platform, so she did a lot of speaking engagements. She testified in front of Congress for women's rights. Um, She in particular testified for women, um, civil war nurses to get a pension. And that was, she was part of that progress. She wasn't the reason it happened, but she did testify in front of Congress for that. She testified for women to have the right to vote. Um, A lot of different, (laughs) a lot of different points um, on women's rights. Um, She went overseas for a while in the early 1870s and did speaking engagements over there and was well received by the women's suffrage movements, women's rights movements that were taking place in, in, um, in particular England. She did go to France as well. Um, she did a lot of writing, a lot of op-eds. Um, she wrote at least two books, which are really rather interesting. One is called HIT, just the word HIT, H-I-T. Um, and then the other one, I can't remember the name of right now, of course, but she did a lot of um, writing and speaking and, and testifying and making her words known. I want to thank you on behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library um, for being our guest speaker from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, Laura Jowdry. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Information about more program opportunities, current and upcoming exhibitions, and library resources are all available on our website, priskermilitary.org. And thank you again for joining us. This concludes our program. <laughs>